Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, my name is Efsan Um Currently, I'm a PhD candidate. Actually, I'm at the end of my PhD. Uh, I'm working on visual attention and memory currently. So that's what I'm going to talk about, the relationship between visual attention and memory today to you. So think about yourself in pub quiz. So they brought your paper to you and it, has, uh, it is asking the capital cities of some countries. And one of them is Australia. You want beer at the same time and you want to remember the capital city of Australia. You cannot remember because you want to call for the waiter or waitress. And the beer blocks uh, you, your memory retrieval or how you uh, access to your long-term memory because you keep this information in your mind. So I'm going to talk about this today, why we forget this information, but I am particularly interested in how it happens in our visual world, so that's why I'm going to talk about uh, visual attention. So my question is, do secondary working memory tasks play a role in long-term memory retrieval? What is working memory? Working memory is a cognitive system where we temporarily keep information. For example, I ask you, calculate 15 times 4, and then you think about it. This is your active memory. And long-term memory is a storage to keep information over a long period of time, which can be your telephone number, the birthday of your girlfriend, boyfriend, or the day you met with her or him. But I'm interested in this visually, yes? So how we do it in visual tasks is this. So in visual working memory tasks, we ask participants to keep the location of these dots in their mind, for example. And then after a period of time, we give another window and ask them if the location of this dot matches with the locations that they are keeping in their mind. Um, and then they should confirm if it matches or it doesn't match. And in long-term memory, in visual studies, I use especially a visual context memory task where we ask participants to find the target location T among L distractor items. I'm going to talk about this more. So, do secondary working memory tasks play a role in long-term memory retrieval? What do I say when I say retrieval? So there are two phases when we learn or when we keep information. In learning phase, we encode the information. So it comes to through our sensory uh, system and then we encode this information in our environment and then we, this information goes to our long-term memory. And when we retrieve information, we actually successfully access our learned information. For example, I want to remember my phone number and then I retrieve this memory. But how does visual search work? I want to talk about it. Extracting statistical regularities is part of our, from a visual scene, is part of our visual system. And we are living in a rich environment, lots of information coming or flowing through our system, but we cannot handle with all of this visual information. Therefore, our visual system is selective. And context information is important because this context information guides our attention to the relevant information for us. And it helps us to select the relevant information. For example, uh, you are walking in a street or you want to find your house, basically. Every day you do this automatically, right? But for the first time, when you move to a new place, you have to learn all the information and that creates all the context for you. Um, and this context information also as, uh, helps us to recognize the Im relevant information, for example, the location of our house, and to control our action. For example, this is your bedroom. Think about that. This is the door. You enter the, uh, to your room, and you know what is where. Your bed is here, your television is here, your lamp, your sofa is here. Even if you close your eyes, close your eyes, you remember the context of your room, right? So, th 
this is we remember this because the relationship between these items or the association between these items creates a map or creates context in our mind, which we call visual context. But in lab environments, how we measure it is a little bit different. So we give participants a task like this, I mentioned to you, and we ask them to find the target T among all distractor items as fast as possible. Again, the relationship between these items creates a context or a map in your mind. That we call contextual queuing. So with contextual queuing task, the task that I have just shown you, in uh, we, with this task, we investigate guidance of visual search by long-term memory. And we record reaction times, which means whenever you find the target location, you press either mouse button or keyboard button, and that's your reaction time that, that we record. And we give participants two different display types, or two different contexts. One, the context that you're familiar with, which is a repeated context, it can be your room context, and another non-repeated context, it's a random context, it can be a new context. For example, I change the context of your room all the time. And when you enter your room, you have to learn where, what, where the items are again and again over the time. So it's very uh, time consuming for the brain. And the explanation is that the associative learning or the learning of the relationship between items guides our attention towards the target location. This is our lab environments. Participants come and sit in front of a computer and do the visual search tasks. So, we particularly, in our task, ask subjects to find rotate a T among all distractor items while half of the displays are repeated and the other half is random. Let's do the task together, shall we? So raise your hand when you find the target T, okay? You haven't found yet, come on. Now, fixate to the fixation cross and find the T as fast as possible. Awesome. Now fixate again and find the T again. Awesome reaction times. Now, this is a repeated context. Your reaction times were faster. Find the T again. So this is a non-repeated new context for you, right? You haven't seen this before. This is, so, we record reaction times of this repeated and non-repeated displays, and we subtract the reaction times of repeated displays from non-repeated displays and find contextual queuing effect. Basically, this is our reaction times, this is time, and the reaction times of repeated display is getting faster when compared to non-repeated display, and this difference gives us the contextual keying effect, or how we learn context. So scientifically, this is how we measure it. Do secondary working memory tasks play a role in long-term memory retrieval? That's particularly what I'm interested in. So for this, I combined a visual working memory task with a contextual queuing task, or long-term contextual queuing task. So with this task, with this task. Let's do this experiment again. Two, six. Sure. <laughs> so keep these two digits in your mind. Remember the locations of these dots, okay? And find the T now. Awesome. Now, fixate. So does this location match with the locations that you have seen before? Yes. Correct. So how about these digits? Have you heard about these digits before? So this is how I combine a working memory task with a long-term context memory task, OK? So I have done two experiments. Um, I divided my experiments into two parts as learning and retrieval. So in experiment one, I applied this working memory task only in the learning phase, not in the retrieval phase. And in the second experiment, I applied this uh, working memory task only in the retrieval phase, where you recall that memories. Okay? And wha what we found or in our lab, uh, long-term mem long context memory retrieval is influenced by working memory task. 
So it means that in order to retrieve information from my long-term memory, if I occupy that working memory um, space, let's say, I am no longer able to do visual search or my visual attention decays. So I have a model like this. Um, so we can not directly retrieve information to do visual search. We use working memory as a workspace to do that. Whenever I block this, you are no longer do to you are no longer able to do search. So let's apply this to our first experiment. You want to retrieve the name of Australia's capital city. It doesn't come to your mind because you want to drink beer and you cannot express um, what is the capital city of uh, Australia, even if you know it by heart. So this is the model. When you experience such a thing next time, you should maybe remember this. Thank you very much. If you're interested in more in this study, uh, our study is published in 2013 in Journal of Vision. You can always ask me questions as well, right now or later. Thank you very much for your attention and thank you very much for the 15 times four organizers for everything, actually. Thank you very much, Efsan, for the delightful talk. Your question, please. Yeah. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks a lot for a great talk. I have just a quick question that when you mentioned that if we block the working memory, according to your working memory is like for the short term, right? So like what I we are doing. It's part of short term memory. It's a you part of the short term yeah. memory. So as soon as you block the working memory, we cannot even retrieve the long-term information which we retrieve with our closed eyes. So that's that was the conclusion. That's right? what we found, at least, in our uh -huh. experiments. And how did you find that out? Means uh, uh, what kind of, uh, like in your studies, which I thought that they are happening in the room, like this in front exactly. of the Exactly. So I mean, this is how psychophysical studies work, actually. Um, we seat a subject in front of a computer and give a task. And I showed you one trial. We give subjects usually uh, 768 trials or sometimes even more. <laughs> uh, so they have to sit in front of a computer quite a long time. Uh, and after that, of course, we uh, record all the reaction times and do all these calculations, basically. But how do you put the distraction uh, during the study? Do you give them a beer or something like this in the <laughs> middle of your study? No, actually it's all visual. I'm, ah, uh, okay. I'm interested in visual task. Actually it can be an interesting task maybe in the future if we have uh, the possibility of recording reaction times in uh, virtual reality for example. People are uh, actually trying to do the studies in virtual reality right now. It can be an interesting study. Yeah. Uh, I can be a volunteer and you give me a beer for sure. a that would be good. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah, of course. Any other questions? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yes. yeah. And uh, if a subject uh, has to pass uh, around 700 uh, experiments, how do you account for the trial? You mean? Yeah, trial. How do you account for the fact that he will just be tired to the, uh, at the end of the experiment? He will be tired. Yes, this is a uh, we are very. This is a confounding uh, factor. Actually, we are aware of it. For that, actually, we uh, give subjects. If, for example, this experiment takes two and a half hours, and it's really difficult for a person to sit in front of a computer and do this task for two and a half hours. That's why I have to give uh, some breaks after every hour or like every forty-five minutes, and uh, actually give them some chocolates. <laughs> it works. <laughs> what was your sample size and uh, what were the filters when selecting the people? I only talked about two studies here, but I have done seven of them. Uh, so I collected data from all in all 136 people. And for this particular two studies, it's uh, 17 for each of them. So for like psychophysical studies, it's usually a uh, normal amount of people. And um, what, what filters? For example, drivers. You know that drivers are known to smoke while talking on the yeah. phone while driving. And yeah, this is a very good question. Actually, this can be a re real-world example. 
Uh, but there are people doing this studies in ergonomic ergonomics department actually, um, but not particularly this context study. So that will be interesting to apply. Actually, that's one of my plans maybe in the future. Yeah, very good question. Hi, thanks. Um, you talked about how um, working memory kind of um, can make long-term memory retrieval worse. But is there any way in which you can improve uh, long-term memory retrieval? Uh, excellent. Yes. Uh, that's my last uh, paper. Um, when you train participants from the beginning of the experiment until the end for two, two hours, two and a half hours, they actually improve in their retrieval. Yes, it is possible, but with training only. Yeah. Okay, and last question, please. Does it mean that um, they can work simultaneously, that they have something to in mind, or like in the working memory, and then they retrieve also? Uh, yes, they actually, um, when you train participants, I cannot say they don't use their working memory, they of course use, but they are not so much dependent on that when you train them. But this, this is a really long training, um, not like uh, dividing the experiment in two phases, you give like 780 trials or something just for this experiment, so it is possible. All right. Please feel free to ask further questions to Afsan or to Marcus during the break. Thank you very much. Have